Welcome back to the Lamp Post Listener. My name is Daniel. And I'm Phil. And this is a podcast where we journey chapter by chapter through C.S. Lewis's Chronicles of Narnia. This episode is chapter five, back on this side of the door from the lion, the witch, and the wardrobe. Phil, are you excited to be here today? I am ready and excited. I am excited that we have the only chapter of this book that has that doesn't have any scenes that take place in Narnia. Did you How notice did you know that? that? You didn't read ahead, did you? <laughs> oh, yeah. Oops, sorry. I forgot. We haven't read. Uh, I have never read this book past chapter six. That's the story Spoiler we're going through. Spoiler alert. Five. <laughs> Every chapter from this point forward will have a scene in Narnia. Oh, what were we thinking? Uh, telling people <laughs> that. I'm sorry, listeners who are reading this for the first time. Um, in our last episode, we left Lucy and Edmund returning to Narnia to their older siblings ready, or at least one of them was ready, to share their stories um, of their time in Narnia. Phil, before we move on to the next chapter, do you have any addendums or corrections from chapter four? I don't. How about you? Uh, not that I'm aware of. They're probably something we should have changed. But, we'll probably um, figure them out around episode seven. Yeah, we'll figure them out uh, when we're reading The Silver Chair in a couple of years. <laughs> All right, so I'm going to go ahead and jump into my chapter summary for chapter five. Are you ready? I'm ready. Let's go. Edmund and Lucy return from Narnia through the wardrobe. Lucy is excited that Edmund has visited Narnia, and the two go to find Peter and Susan. Upon meeting up with their older siblings, Lucy is distraught when Edmund claims to have been only playing along with Lucy's silly story. Peter and Susan are frustrated with Edmund for teasing Lucy, but they're more concerned with their younger sister's refusal to admit her story is false. They decide to talk to the professor. Surprisingly, however, he seems to believe Lucy and claims that logic provides the explanation that Edmund is lying and Lucy is telling the truth. He even advises them to mind their own business. Days later, after things have settled down, Mrs. McCready is giving a tour of the house. As the Pevensies tried to avoid the guests, they accidentally, or maybe purposefully, end up hiding in the wardrobe. And that was 149 words. I'm really proud of myself. <laughs> nice. Yeah, I think I, I was 148 last time. I think we're really pushing the limit. I love it. Yeah, it's fun to try to get these chapter summaries um, under that limit because I want to add a little bit of um, kind of my voice to the chapter summary, but I also have to be careful because then the more I add of me, the more I have to leave out of the actual story. So this is it's fun to do this. It is. You should try. Uh, there's a new site called Twitter. You should try that. <laughs> no, I think I'm okay. Uh, we have the. Uh, well, that's a good plug, I guess, for our uh, Twitter. I think we're at Narnia Podcast. So check us out there. Um, <laughs> Phil, I want to start out just by reading uh, the first couple of paragraphs from this chapter because I think it gives us a really good idea of where we're going. Do you mind okay, if I do and- that? I don't, and then I'm, I'm going to re- read a section starting with an Edmund Gave uh, right after that. We'll talk about it after you do your reading. Great. Because the game of hide-and-seek was still going on, it took Edmund and Lucy some time to find the others. But when at last they were all together, which happened in the long room where the suit of armor was, Lucy burst out. Peter, Susan, it's all true. Edmund has seen it too. There is a country you can get to through the wardrobe. Edmund and I both got in. We met one another in there, in the wood. Go on, Edmund, tell them all about it. What's all this about, Ed? said Peter. And now we come to one of the nastiest things in this story. Up to that moment, Edmund had been feeling sick and sulky and annoyed with Lucy for being right, but he hadn't made up his mind what to do. When Peter suddenly asked him the question, he decided all at once to do the meanest and most spiteful thing he could think of. He decided to let Lucy down. Right when he says... Uh, When Peter suddenly asked him the question, he decided all at once to do the meanest and most spiteful thing he could think of. He decided to let Lucy down. And then Susan asked him to tell uh, tell them what what he's talking about. And then Edmund gave a very superior look, as if he were far older than Lucy. So we see a little bit of Edmund in there, like we were talking about last episode. And there's only a year's difference. And then a little snigger and said... Oh, yes, Lucy and I had been playing, pretending that all her story about a country in the wardrobe is true. Just for fun, of course. There's nothing there, really. And then this is the best part. The reason I wanted to get to this point is, in one sentence, it communicates so much about what just happened. And it says, poor Lucy gave Edmund one look and rushed out of the room. That's just so brutal. Um, Because Lucy, like, she can't even talk. 
she's so hurt by it. Yeah, this whole section that starts the chapter off, it actually made me realize why I wasn't in love with chapter four and why I've never, um, that's never been one of my favorite chapters. And this chapter starts off so strong with Lewis's voice at the fourth front. And I think that's what we were missing in the last chapter, or at least what I, I felt was missing. We get so much of Lewis's uh, narration and, and just his writing style here. I mean, it starts off with, you know, but when they last, you know, they all got together, which by the, you know, way happened in the long room where the suit of armor was like, we don't have to know any of that stuff, but it just kind of, it it adds to the story. Um, It does help. And it does make it seem like he, he's a little more in control of the story now because he knows exactly where that's going to take place. Exactly. And he even then talks to us as the readers when he's like, okay, guys, now, by the way, this is one of the nastiest things we're going to come across in this story. And I just, I love that aside to the audience and almost kind of like preparing the, the, the children reading this, like, hey, okay, just be ready. It's going to be some pretty bad stuff that's about to happen. Um, and I, I just felt like we were missing some of that in the last chapter. Like chapter four had to be really exposition heavy and had to fill out um, the character of the White Witch and give us a better idea of who she was. And because of that, we didn't get as much of Lewis's voice, which really just comes on really strong here at the beginning. It sure does. Let me ask you this. We stopped in the last chapter with Edmund only being, what was it, like more than half or like mostly on the witch's side? What was the exact, do you remember what it was? It seemed like he was basically half on that side. Let me see if I can find it real quick. Yep, I did. But he was already more than half on the side of the witch. Exactly. So is this the point where it says he decided to let Lucy down? Do you think this actually might be where Edmund is now on the side of the witch? Or is this a different thing? I think Edmund is always on Edmund's side. (laughs) And in this (laughs) case, it winds up with the the witch's... uh, influence on him i guess because he wants to get the reward from her so you would say this is edmund being malicious for his sake and not being malicious for the uh i almost called her the queen i guess she is for the white witch's sake yeah i I would think so and have you ever had a moment like that where you just you know either for good or for bad but you haven't quite made up your mind yet and it's almost like you have made up your mind but you're not willing to admit it to yourself and it's kind of like you're trying to hold back until you get to the actual moment to decide and then you choose and it's just like once you've chosen like now you're going down that rabbit hole when you say that it makes me think of Edmund being sick in the last episode and i was thinking or last chapter our last episode too I was thinking he was feeling sick because he's going to have to go back and say that Lucy was right. But I actually now think that he was feeling sick because he couldn't decide what to do. Like he was either going to have to face his brother and sister and say, actually, guys, Lucy was right. I was wrong. Or he was going to have to go to them and lie, which he knew is wrong in and of itself. And I think that's that sickness was coming from the conflict. I'd like to propose a third option. Okay. I think it's because he ate several pounds of Turkish Delight. <laughs> That's very true as well. So you imagine just, eating several me, pounds? <laughs> so first of all, several pounds of anything. Of anything. <laughs> that is so much. Um, but let's talk about what's in Turkish Delight. I actually wrote it down. It has sugar, honey, water, and cream of tartar. And he ate several pounds of it. Yeah, you're not going to feel good after doing that. <laughs> like, there's no way. If, if you eat... Uh, several pounds of spinach you're still not you're not going to feel good after any of that so maybe you're right maybe it's kind of a mixture of all of those you know right and lucy storms out edmund is like well yeah look at you know look at kids these days (laughs) and um (laughs) and peter oh he gets really mad he savagely says shut up to him for being perfectly beastly to lou and edmund is really taken aback because i he really thought peter and Susan would join his side like, oh, yeah, she's just crazy, you know, and they are worried about Lucy, but they're also really frustrated with Edmund for kind of feeding this lunacy is what they're going to refer to it as in just a little bit. Right. They're, they're concerned for Lucy at this point. Yeah, they're really concerned. They can't figure out what's making her do all these things. She is not backing down from this story. She's like, no, no, no. I went to this place. You know, after the first time being there, she did start wondering if this was a dream or not. But it does make sense that after being there a second time and then seeing her brother there, she now is like, no, 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 I'm telling the truth. And so this leads 
Susan and Peter, they kind of become the mom and dad for a second, and they go talk to the professor, who we really have not spent much time with yet. C.S. Lewis writes that they stood in the passage talking about it in whispers long after she had gone to bed, meaning Lucy. The result was the next morning they decided that they would go and tell the whole thing to the professor. He'll write to father if he thinks there really, something is really wrong with Lou, said Peter. It's getting beyond us. And I really like the juxtaposition here. Although Peter and Susan do make some mistakes, uh, especially in this chapter, we saw Edmund be extremely prideful in this chapter and in the last chapter. And here, Peter and Susan are admitting that they do not know what to do, and they want someone with more authority and wisdom to enter into the situation. And I, th- I think that's very wise, too. It's like they're obviously out of their element, especially they're thinking that this is like some mental issue. Um, so I think it's wise to, to go to an adult in this case. Yeah, I think it really builds up their characters well. We've barely spent any time with Peter and Susan at this point. I mean, I feel like we don't, especially Susan, she hasn't even talked that much. Uh, And we'll get into her role more as this story unravels. But even Peter has really, his only job has been to correct Edmund and Lucy at different points or to ask them questions. He really hasn't done anything besides that. Oh, except, uh, oh, maybe we'll go see some badgers and stuff. He was really excited about the, the grounds of the house. And so our first real glimpse of him as a character, along with Susan, is them saying, we need some help here. And I really like that. It makes me really appreciate Peter and Susan's maturity, even though they're just teenagers. Yeah, definitely. So they talk to the professor, and he clears his throat after a very long time of listening to them and being silent. And he just says, how do you know that your sister's story is not true? And they're totally not expecting that. Yeah. That's the last thing they, they expect. Yeah, it's so great. You know, th- Peter and Susan are so taken aback by this idea that the professor's first question would be, well, I mean, how come this, how do you know that your sister's lying? When to them, it seems so obvious that this has to be a lie, that she has to be confused or crazy. What do you make of this for the professor's very first words that he says? I think it shows a lot about the professor's character and just the huge age difference between the two. I think there's a certain point where people start asking why or how a lot more instead of just taking things for granted. Phil, do you actually know who the professor is? I don't, but I was kind of wondering about it because he he knows that there are things in the house that even he doesn't fully understand. Um, But it does seem like his reaction about there being an entire world and the portal being in one of the rooms in in his house, he doesn't seem concerned or surprised by it. Um, I, I think that surprise is the biggest. You're right. Yeah. He's not, he's, I, I could see him maybe not being concerned or, well, I, that doesn't make sense either, but he's not at all surprised that someone has gotten into another magical land. And Um, We will learn more about the professor in other books. Again, we're just reading this one book at a time. They're actually really just one chapter at a time. And it leads us to, you know, him asking, well, how, what would make more sense? Edmund lying or Lucy lying? And (laughs) they very easily say, well, of course it would be Edmund. He's the one that does that. So quick, quick question for you. Right at this point, what are you picturing the professor looks like? It doesn't, is, really, doesn't really relate to the story, but I'm curious what you picture. Because we, we do see an illustration, and we've obviously both seen the BBC and the Disney version. Um, yes. But what are you picturing reading this? In my head, I am picturing the Disney version of, of him, which is not what I usually picture. I usually do not picture the Disney versions in my head. But that's – I really like that um, image of him the way that he was transferred to the screen in that movie. And so that's that's who I'm picturing here. So jog my memory. I don't actually remember. It was about 13 well, years ago for me. He's you, Have you not seen the movie in that long? Yeah. Wow. Okay, this will be great. I can't <laughs> wait till we watch it together. I've, I've We watch it every year at the very end of uh, the unit I do with my students on the book. Um, we usually end right around Christmas, and so we watch the movie on the last day of school before Christmas break. So I have seen the movie so much. (laughs) Do you will in a little TV card or is this now on a projector? It's, it's uh, even more 21st century. I have a digital copy of the movie that we, we watch on a projector. No, (laughs) we don't have, uh, we don't have a lot of TVs in the school. 
Um, so he looks, he kind of has like some, um, you know, ruffled hair. He looks very much like you would think an um, Oxford professor. I know this isn't taking place in Oxford, but you would what you would think an Oxford professor looks like. He has kind of this this jacket on that's got some like interesting designs that looks a little eccentric. Just in general, I, I imagine a professor who looks like you might look down on him if you saw him on the street. Like he's he's just eccentric. I think that's the main word I would use. Um, okay. You know, white hair, glasses kind of down on his nose. Um, that's what I think of. Beard or no beard? Uh, beard. I think in the movie he actually has like a goatee or something. I, I imagine full beard though. Okay. So I. What are you imagining? This, this entire time I've been picturing Freud and I realized, <laughs> I realized, I just looked up C.S. Lewis just now and I realized that when I was thinking of C.S. Lewis, I was actually picturing Freud also. So pretty much everyone born around the 1850s and beyond up until the 1920s look like Freud in my mind. <laughs> Everybody, all of them. <laughs> and now you kind of wonder, like, what does that mean? Uh, I don't know. Freud might have a lot to say on it, though. Yeah, well, he's dead. <laughs> That's true. Um, so, yeah, I imagine he looks, um, you know, just kind of like an old eccentric professor to me. So Susan brings up this idea that maybe Lucy is mad, that she's gone crazy. And the professor responds with a very famous quote here. He says, logic. Why don't they teach logic at these schools? There are only three possibilities. Either your sister is telling lies, or she is mad, or she is telling the truth. You know she doesn't tell lies, and it is obvious that she is not mad. For the moment then, and unless any further evidence turns up, you must assume that she is telling the truth. Did you remember this from reading it as a child, or is this something you just kind of came across reading it again as an adult? I did not recall it. I recall very little in terms of quotes, just the trees have ears and maybe one or two other things um, like for Aslan. Uh, but the logic part definitely stood out to me. I, I just love that part. Phil, are you familiar with the Lewis trilemma? Does it, does that sound familiar to you at all? It does not. Is that a band? <laughs> if not, we're claiming it right now. We need to buy the yeah. website, Lewis's trilemma.com. That's um, T R I. I'm just kidding. <laughs> So um, in Lewis's uh, apologetic writing, he has an argument that for the divinity of Jesus. And his argument is Jesus is either a liar, a lunatic, or Lord. Is oh, yes. still... I remember that. I just okay. didn't know um, what a trilemma or a trilemon was. Yeah, I want to read you this quote. This is from Mere Christianity. I am trying here to prevent anyone saying the really foolish thing that people often say about him, him referring to Jesus. I'm ready to accept Jesus as a great moral teacher, but I don't accept his claim to be God. That is the one thing we must not say. A man who was merely a man and said the sort of things Jesus said would not be a great moral teacher. He would either be a lunatic on the level with the man who says he is a poached egg or else he would be the devil of hell. You must make your choice. Either this man was and is the son of God or else a madman or something worse. You can shut him up for a fool. You can spit at him and kill him as a demon, or you can fall at his feet and call him Lord and God. But let us not come with any patronizing nonsense about his being a great human teacher. He has not left that open to us. He did not intend to. And then I'm going to skip down to this last little part. Now, it seems to me obvious that he was neither a lunatic nor a fiend. And consequently, however strange or terrifying or unlikely it may seem, I have to accept the view that he was and is God. Have you ever heard that before? I have heard that. I read Mere Christianity several years ago, and that's a that's just a wonderful argument. I've also um, talked to people about it, and that's been brought up before by them. Yeah, it's a really interesting argument. And there definitely is you know, criticism given by both Christians and non-Christians alike about it simplifying things and they're being, especially from Christians, people, the argument, well, theologically, there's some other things here. And there's some of those arguments have weight behind them, but I I think remembering the context of what it's being written in, or technically it was spoken as a radio address, but mere Christianity is literally boiling down Christianity to be mere Christianity. He's taking it down to like, it's the bare bones of what Christianity is. And so what we're getting is a 
a simplified logical explanation for the divinity of Jesus. Yeah, it's it's reduced to a certain amount on purpose. Absolutely, like, absolutely. Simplified a little bit. And I, and I really like that argument. I think it's a really strong argument in a lot of ways. And he, I think he probably felt so strongly about this his trilemma that he put it right here in chapter 5 of the book. It's pretty spot on. Either Lucy is a liar, she's mad, or she's telling the truth. He doesn't use those, that same alliteration, but that's the exact same argument. Yeah. That's a, that's a really cool connection that you made. So let's get back into this story. So Peter and Susan are dumbfounded. The professor is seeming to take Lucy's side. And the professor says something else that's really interesting, too. Because Susan points out, well, hey, how come Lucy... Just, you know, her magical land seems to have a different time than us. And this is what the professor says. If there really is a door in this house that leads to some other world, and I should warn you that this is a very strange house, and even I know very little about it, if, I say, she had got into another world, I should not be at all surprised to find that the other world had a separate time of its own, so that however long you stayed there, it would never take up any of our time. On the other hand, I don't think many girls of her age would invent the idea for themselves. If she had been pretending, she would have hidden for a reasonable time before coming out and telling her story. So I really like the last part, because that makes sense logically. Like, if she was a little girl, she probably would have, you know, hid and then come out and told the story. But I want to know what he's thinking along the lines of, oh, well, obviously, if it's a magical world, it would have a different time than ours. Is that something that I should just know, Phil? <laughs> like... It's what stands out to me. So the, I've read this so many times and I read this twice right before this um, recording, but I thought his argument was there's no way she could come up with that many details in a couple of seconds. And that's not at all what is being said here. They're saying that this concept of the time being completely different, more time passing in Narnia than in the real world, um, he thinks that was too complicated for a girl her age to come up with. Um, the emphasis being on her age, not the fact that she's a girl. And then to have the professor point that out, I, it just really makes me think the professor knows more than he lets on. What I'm wondering as someone who is not an expert on these books is, did Lewis know what he would become of the professor? Like, we're going to find out more about him in the later books. Did Lewis know that writing this... Or is that something he just was like, oh, actually, that could actually, we could make that work. Like, is it, is he more of having um, all of this planned out from the very beginning? Or is this more of like a lost thing where we're going to just kind of make it up as we go along and hope it all works out? And I, I want to say, I, I love Lost. I'm not ragging on Lost, but they were making it up as they went along. Yeah. Well, I rag on Lost for that very reason. Yeah. But so I, I think that we have, and we have no way of knowing for sure, but I do think that. Lewis had a plan here, and that's why the professor knew so much. It could be the other way around, but it does seem like he has a plan here. I think the most important thing to take away from this, even if you're reading this as the second book after The Magician's Nephew, or you're reading it correctly as the first book, um, we're learning that the professor knows much more that he is alluding to, and it makes him a very intriguing character throughout this story. And it's almost disappointing when we don't get more from him later, and it makes me really excited to go into the the magician's nephew, spoiler alert, when we learn more about him. So, after this conversation, he does tell Peter and Susan to mind their own business, and we a couple of days pass. We see that the children are kind of starting to get along. They're not really talking about Narnia at all. And then, some visitors come to the house. So these visitors come because we learn that the house is a, a kind of a tourist attraction, for many people to come look at, and Miss McCready really does not like children, and she does not want them to be around the house. So a few mornings later, Peter and Edmund were looking at the suit of armor and wondering if they could take it to bits when the two girls rushed into the room and said, Look out! Here comes the McCready and a whole gang with her! Sharp's the word, said Peter, and all four made off through the door at the far end of the room. Which, <laughs> this is, <laughs> so this is such, the C.S. Lewis's voice is just coming through so loudly here. I love the the sharps the word. Um, I love little bits like that, and I know you're the kind of person who has ordered um, the not only the British version of the Harry Potter books, but also the <laughs> British version of the movies. 
Yep. Um, <laughs> so I'm sure you're a fan of that part. But they also do something interesting here. Um, C.S. Lewis has that suit of armor as an anchor at the beginning and at the end of this chapter. So we kind of we're getting a firmer idea of where in the house this is taking place. And I think it kind of helps add a little more realism to it because it's not just like, oh, they were in a different room. It's like, no, there's that suit of armor again. It's very subtle, but I think it's well done. It's really cool to start developing an idea of place in the mansion. It's sad that we're about to leave the house for really the rest of the story, but it's, I feel like I have a better idea of what this place looks like. But when they had got into the green room and beyond it into the library, they suddenly heard voices ahead of them and realized that Mrs. McCready must be bringing her party of sightseers up the back stairs instead of up the front stairs that they had expected. And after that, whether it was that they lost their heads or that Mrs. McCready was trying to catch them or that some magic in the house had come to life and was chasing them into Narnia, they seemed to find themselves being followed everywhere until at last Susan said, Oh, bother those trippers. Here, let's get into the wardrobe room till they've passed. No one will follow us in there. But the moment they were inside, they heard voices in the passage and then someone fumbling at the door. And then they saw the handle turning. Quick, said Peter, there's nowhere else, and flung open the wardrobe. All four of them bundled inside it and sat there, panting in the dark. Peter held the door closed, but did not shut it. For, of course, he remembered, as every sensible person does, that you should never, never shut yourself up in a wardrobe. And that's where the chapter ends. Does it? If we're keeping count, how many is that? Four? I, we're, five? No, that's five. That's five. Five. There was also a repetition of um, beastly and then beast and then beast um, on one of the previous pages in this chapter, too. Yeah. C.S. Lewis is really telling us as readers, do not lock ourselves into wardrobes. He puts never, ne- he doubles the word right there. Yeah, so never, we are, never. as children, not going to uh, put ourselves into, the, into a wardrobe and lock ourselves in there. That's right. I think at this point, I've definitely decided he's doing this to warn readers. This this is 100% to keep readers from locking themselves in a wardrobe. You don't want to be responsible for people getting stuck in a wardrobe. Yeah. <laughs> I guess even back then people were just... going to be. Yeah. You think what? I guess back then people were still suing over, you know, very silly kind of trivial things. So he's trying to protect himself. Afterwards. I understand. I think that Starbucks stuff was in the 90s when that lady sued for her coffee being too hot. Yeah. He just he was ahead of his time in many, many ways. Um, what do you make of this magic uh, or whatever it is that chasing them into Narnia? I love how it says, and after that, whether it was likely they lost their heads, so that's one option, or that Mrs. McCready was trying to catch them, so that's two options, or that there was some magic in the house come to life and was chasing them into Narnia. It's pretty clear at that point which one it is. <laughs> yeah, Lewis is why, not going to make us guess. Why else bring that option? Yeah. It's it's a hundred percent the magic that's chasing them in Narnia, and I I don't I think it'd be hard to argue that the other things, even if it is Macready trying to catch them, or if it is that they are losing their heads, that that itself isn't caused by the magic of Narnia. Like there's definitely magic or divine providence, whatever we want to call it here, that made it rain on the very first day that led Lucy into the wardrobe. That's the exact same thing that's chasing them into into the wardrobe right now. Would you agree? I would agree. Yeah. That's a great way to end. I am so excited to finally come up to chapter six because as much as I loved this chapter and the chapters before, I think the story really takes off once we get into kind of the second act here in the story in chapter six. Me too. Any final thoughts before we close up this episode? That's it over here. Yeah. All right. So chapter six will be our next episode. It's called Into the Forest. And in that chapter, Peter, Susan, Edmund, and Lucy enter Narnia together. You can follow us into the world of Narnia on our Facebook and Twitter pages. You can also email us at the Narnia podcast at gmail.com with thoughts on chapters, themes, um, and the books themselves. Or let's just say this book for right now. We would appreciate a review on Apple Podcasts because that would help other listeners find this show. Our show's theme was created by Kevin McLeod, and you can find more of his work in the link in our episode's description. Thank you for joining us, and we will see you next time for Chapter 6. See you then.
right, Phil and Daniel, you guys just did a great job on that last episode, but we're now here from the future, and Phil, why are we here from the future at the end of this episode? We're older, wiser, and we have some listener feedback we wanted to share. (laughs) Yes, we have some listener feedback. We recorded this uh, episode that y'all have just listened to back in maybe March, I think, and um, since then, we've actually launched the podcast, and we got a lot of great listener feedback, and we did not expect that, so we're, we're going to go back now, uh, and we're just going to address some emails, some, um, uh, yeah, mostly emails. I think some other people reached out to us in other ways on the internet, too. I wanted to start out, before we say anything, though, and just thank um, everybody over at Narnia Web, who has been extremely supportive and welcoming to us. Um, listeners, if you're not familiar with Narnia Web, um, which you, you might be, but you might not be. Uh, NarniaWeb.com is a website. They follow a lot of the movie news. Um, they've been around for, it seems like, over a decade following these the, the adaptations and talking about the books. And Brian, a.k.a. Glumpuddle, specifically over there at NarniaWeb, has been extremely welcoming to us. Um, NarniaWeb has its own podcast called Talking Beasts, and they have been generous and kind enough that they actually played a little bit of our trailer over on their show, which is actually a really amazing thing because there's a lot of people that could maybe, you know, see another Narnia podcast come up and be like, oh man, it's like, it's, it's competition or something like that, you know, and we're not doing uh, a, a, a similar thing. We're definitely have different approaches to these books, but, but they've been extremely welcoming to us. They've been um, really happy that we've kind of joined this community. And I think that not only shows just um, their kindness, but also their love for these books, that they are just so in love with these books that they just are just happy to see this community grow. And so we just wanted to go ahead and give them a shout out, tell them thank you so much, and to point listeners in the direction of both NarniaWeb.com and the Talking Beasts podcast, well, which um, I'll actually put in, a, in the description below of this episode. We really appreciate it, guys, and I love the cover art on uh, Talking Beasts. That's great. What else do we have, bud? Oh, we have an email from Patty. I'm going to read a good chunk of it. Uh, she was kind enough to send us a message, and here it is. In a world now filled with so much controversy and strife, how great it is to take some time to go to a beautiful place with you both. You guys work well together, a good blend and foil for each other, personality and the artist slash teacher. Appreciate your honesty and insights, i.e. Tolkien-Lewis comparison. Love how you're going chapter by chapter. Thank you for the diligent prep, research, and fantastic links. I'm really glad you're not experts. The humility and invitation for others to join is there. Keep up the good work. Want to journey through all the books with you both. Further up and further in, Patty and Old Narnian. <laughs> that, that was really sweet. Was, she, also, yeah. she also followed up and she had something to say about Lucy's handkerchief. Yeah, tell me, what'd she say about it? She said, uh, Lucy's handkerchief, really like how you guys approach the characters in Chapter 2, citing how Lewis reveals much depth to Lucy and Tumnus and Narnia through their actions and the stories. This also applies to Tumnus asking for the handkerchief. It reveals his affection and connection to her that will play out through the book. It shows readers he's a good guy who realizes what he's done for WW is wrong. Shoot, what is WW? The White Witch, dude. <laughs> oh, man. I got to get these No, no it's fine. You're, you're showing uh, that you are not an expert and that uh, and, and it's welcoming for others that, that you are being humble here in this. <laughs> All these code words, man. Uh, Lewis has the show Don't Tell Writing Down Pat. Keeps the flow going. Love it. Uh, yes, thanks for that, Patty. Uh, we, we appreciate it. Yes, thank you so much, Patty. We love uh, that insight. We appreciate you for taking the time out of your life to contact us. That really means a lot to us. And thank you just for the kind words as well. Um, Speaking of Lucy's handkerchief, though, I also have, uh, we got some comments over on Twitter from David over at the Eagle and Child podcast. Um, On the Eagle and Child podcast, David and his friend, they go through C.S. Lewis's works one chapter at a time like we do, but they're actually going through uh, his nonfiction work. They actually just finished recently Mere Christianity. Have you listened at all, uh, Phil, to their podcast? I have not yet, but I'll check it out. You should really check it out. It's really, really great. Um, they have, they have uh, you know, again, unlike us, uh, they are much more similar to everybody over at Narnia Web where they know a ton about um, Lewis's life and his works, and it's just... 
a lot of great knowledge and a lot of great encouragement, especially just hearing um, two guys go through Lewis's uh, Christian works. And so I've really appreciated um, listening to them. But David actually reached out to us, and he had he had a comment about Mr. Tumnus and the handkerchief. He said, I had always thought he wanted to keep it as a memento of Lucy's kindness towards him. It's clear he lives in a scary and dangerous world, and his encounter with this daughter of Eve was one of pure grace. He meant to do her harm, and yet she forgave and comforted him. He wanted to hold on to something tangible from that encounter. Anyway, that's my two cents. Looking forward to listening to the, re- to the next episode further up and further in. Before we comment on that, Phil, I just want to ask you this. Speaking of code words, do you have any idea what further up and further in means or where that's from or... I don't, but at this point, I feel like I need to. It's the second <laughs> time in like 35 seconds I've heard it. Yeah, uh, I, I'm, I won't comment. Uh, I don't want to tell you. So you'll find out as okay, we get to these so books. That, that narrows it down to the next six books, right? Yes, it's in okay. one of the next six books. Um, but I really enjoyed uh, and appreciated David's comments, especially as you and I were kind of talking through the reasons we kept it. Uh, I liked his because they were more in line with my comments. So I really appreciate David reaching out and making me feel better about myself. <laughs> because uh, he agrees with me that he kept it as a memento and not with you that he kept it as a way to prove that she escaped. (laughs) Uh, I I think that's Is that about all we have, Phil? I think that's it for now. Yes. So again, listeners, thank you so much for reaching out to us. We really appreciate that. Um, Thank you for all the kind words from those of y'all who have been a part of the Narnian community for much longer than we have. We really do appreciate the warm welcome. Um, And we would just encourage uh, y'all to keep contacting us and also to tell your friends or family who also um, love Narnie just to uh, listen to the show. We just have really appreciated how many people have started listening. This is great. We, we, um, We feel really blessed. And so thank you guys so much for tuning in.